Right, everyone, welcome to the first literature guest lecture of the year. We're delighted um, to have Michaela Hausmann with us from the University of Fechter in Germany. We have an Erasmus exchange link with the University of Fechter. Uh, students from Fechter can come and study here. Students from Inverness can go and study in Fechter. Um, I spent six weeks there some, some years ago. It's quite exciting. <laughs> nice little town. Very, very different from here, but, but in a good way. It's um, a good <laughs> Today we've got uh, students in Inverness, the lecture's also being recorded. I'm just looking around, I think we've got Invernesians on every level of study, first years, second years, third years, and fourth years. Hmm. Quite exciting, wow. I don't think we've ever managed that before. So, That's great. So looking at a broad sweep of, <laughs> of, of Inverness students. Um, here's a lecture at the University of Fechter, and she's also doing a PhD there on fantasy literature. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what she's come to speak to us about. There's a, a PowerPoint, we'll switch over to that in a minute. Um, is everyone comfortable? Everyone happy? Right. Zoom in on you, sorry. Ah. <laughs> Slightly older. Right. That makes it easier to follow later. Okay, um, first of all, um, thanks for the kind introduction and thanks for having me here. I'm very pleased and I do appreciate it that you've all come despite the late hour, so I'm very happy. Well, imagine you want to read a new book. You obtain a copy, withdraw to a cozy place, so with a fireplace or the beach or packed bus, whatever you like, maybe with a glass of wine or a warm mug of tea, whatever you like. Once you've made yourself comfortable and you start flipping through the pages and the smooth, smoothly formatted prose starts to lull you in, then suddenly there comes a shift a break in the page, a different format, or a shift from prose to verse. Now, if you like fantasy literature, um, this might happen quite often. And just to show you what I mean, I um, brought you a picture of the five fantasy narratives I'm working on for my PhD. And all these little colorful uh, post-its actually mark the occurrence of a poem, some of which are only very short, so two or three lines long. Others cover several pages. So you see there's a lot of material to work on. While noticing that poems feature so prominently in fantasy narratives, I was beginning to ask myself two questions. Why are there so many poems in fantasy narratives? What influences on the genre may have played a role in that respect? And the second question, why are these poems in there? What are their functions for the overall narrative in which they appear? Well, I've been asking myself those questions for two years now, and I still haven't got all the answers I'm looking for, so I'm still working on it. But I found um, at least some answers, and um, I would like to share those uh, with you in the course of my talk. For that purpose, I've chosen the following outline. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the influences on the genre of fantasy, um, which may have contributed to its affinity for poetry. And in the second part, we're going to look at the forms and functions of a few selected poems from George MacDonald's Fantastis, Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, and J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Well, the birth of modern fantasy as a genre in its own right is usually set in the middle of the 19th century. Of course, fantastic elements have been part of literature ever since human beings devise stories in forms of myths, folk tales, legends, and romances. But the use of fantastic elements, the playful invention of imaginary beings and worlds, had rarely been conducted as an end in itself, nor had they been seen as the central and defining aspect of the literary work. The 19th century, however, was characterized by certain developments that facilitated the emergence of fantasy literature. One of these factors was, was the predominance of the realist novel, with its emphasis on factuality and mimesis, against which fantasy could establish itself as a countercurrent, as Richard Matthews explains in a study with the telling title, Fantasy, the Liberation of Imagination. The insightful and influential modern authors who crafted fantasy as an alternative literary form seem intuitively to have understood that they could create a complex and appealing counterpoint to popular fiction about ordinary life 
by imbuing their writing with ancient human impulses towards myth and romance. <coughs> So instead of mirroring reality, fantasy purposefully explores those regions of the human imagination that are concerned with absurdities, playful invention, and blatant impossibilities. In fact, the notion of containing impossibilities has become a defining criterion of many modern fantasy literature and seminal works on that genre. I just collected here um, a couple of quotes or definitions of fantasy that uh, stress the idea of impossibility. So John Clute, for example, <coughs> argues, when set in this world, fantasy tells a story which is impossible in the world as we perceive it. When set in another world, that other world will be impossible. Those stories set there may be possible, and it's, it's, a, it's a bit difficult to frame to phrase, but I think you get the idea. Um, Mikkelsen actually phrases it more colloquially, so she says, fantasy is the stuff with magic and fairies and impossible occurrences in it. Atterbury argues that the essential content of fantasy is the impossible. <coughs> and Matthews again says, fantasy as a distinct literary genre, however, may best be thought of as a fiction that elicits wonder through elements of the supernatural or impossible. <coughs> I believe it is possible that this artistic opposition to the realist novel may also have manifested itself in the literary style. While both genres used the form of the novel, realist fiction almost exclusively relies on prose, whereas many of the earliest works of fantasy are peppered with poems. I'll show you in a minute. <laughs> Other possible influences worth mentioning are certain cultural developments of that time. The gradual expansion of the empire, for instance, produced novelties on a regular basis. New countries, new animals, and first and foremost, new people with their own culture and customs spurred the imagination <coughs> Sorry, um, of several authors, for example, Jules Verne uh, is very important, um, William Ryder Haggard, whose um, novels are set on the African continent, but always contain a sort of impossible element such as immortality, and um, also Stevenson's Treasure Island. Although these works cannot be considered genuine fantasy literature, they nevertheless play with ideas of the exotic, strange, and unexplored that also influence fantasy literature. In addition to this, the discovery of dinosaur skeletons in the subterranean strata of the Earth from the first half of the 19th century onwards suddenly brought fantastic monsters into people's very backyards. So as Stephen Prickett describes in his work, Victorian Fantasy, in less than a generation, the monsters from underground had shattered an entire world picture and confronted men with dark, unimaginable vistas of pre-human history. Um, Charles Darwin's or, uh, publication of Origin of Species all, also plays into that, of course. Images of horror, which had always leaned towards the slimy and the scaly, became more specifically reptilian. The most profound catalysts for the emergence of fantasy literature, however, were, in my opinion, two preceding literary traditions, the Gothic novel and Romanticism. With the success of the Gothic novel in the late 18th century, supernatural and horror elements in literature became considerably fashionable. Monsters, ghosts, uh, sexually predatory aristocrats roamed the dark medieval settings of damp labyrinthine vaults haunted graveyards and cursed castles, and thus attracted a large readership. Apart from the obvious connections to fantasy literature, some writers like Anne Radcliffe or Matthew Gregory Lewis used a large number of poems in their novels as foreshadowing devices or to mirror the protagonist's internal condition. As we will see later on, this is also um, something you find in fantasies, uh, the connection to the plot and to characters will reappear in a minute. So the Gothic tradition is actually an important forerunner, in my opinion. 
However, one accusation often leveled against Gothic fiction is that the supernatural aspects often serve sensationalist purposes and appear like ludicrous products of an overexcited or feverish imagination. In short, the fantastic elements of Gothic fiction and the imagination that produced them were not taken seriously and often subjected to parody as in Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey. A more serious approach to the fantastic imagination was undertaken in the course of Romanticism in the late 18th and the first half of the 19th century. Not only did Coleridge's concept of a creative imagination favor the playful use of artistic invention and reshaping, many romantic writers also experimented with new forms, breaking with rigid traditions and restrictions of literary style. Most importantly, though, the romantic movement went hand in hand with a new interest in the supernatural and transcendental, the rediscovery of folk tales and ballads that often included fantastic elements, and a newfound appreciation for medieval chivalry and romance as prominently cultivated by Walter Scott, for instance. All these aspects um, are frequently found in fantasy literature, which is also the reason why it has uh, often been associated with um, escapism and nostalgia. And if you're interested in these discussions, read up um, Tolkien's famous essay on fairy story, because he actually takes up this notion on escapism and kind of defends it. It's very interesting to read. Um, <clears throat> Walter Scott should be mentioned here in particular because he used many poems in his works, some of which he attributed to a vernacular folk tradition, even though he composed most of them himself. Nevertheless, his poems resonate with an allusion to an oral tradition and a legendary past, and I think this function is still part of many of the poems you find in fantasy literature. So the idea that there's an oral tradition behind this that makes it actually credible. About 20 years after Scott's death, another Scottish writer, George MacDonald, then produced a so-called romance written for adults with a telling title, Fantastus, which is conventionally seen as the real starting shot of modern fantasy literature. And with that, I would like to conclude this short and therefore necessarily incomplete overview um, on the development of the fantasy genre and proceed to some examples of embedded poems and fantasy narratives. Honor to whom honor is due, I would like to start with George MacDonald's Fantastus. This narrative, which shares similarities with traditional quest narratives and the Bildungsroman, so the, the genre of personal development, um, follows the protagonist, Anodos. This Greek term means rising up or finding your path. So, again, a very telling name. Um, so the story follows his uh, transformative journey through fairyland, where his strange experiences with fantastic creatures enable him to become a less selfish and more spiritual person. The poem I've chosen is sung by a young maiden who had been wronged by Anodos beforehand, but who, having learned her own lesson about forgiveness and compassion, liberates Anodos from his imprisonment in a tower. When they finally part, he hears her singing this song. Thou goest thine, and I go mine, many ways we wend, many days and many ways, ending in one end. Many a wrong and its curing song, many a road and many an inn, room to roam, but only one home for all the world to win. Regarding the formal features, the many internal rhymes such as thine, mine, days, ways, wrong, song, roam, home, as well as the repetition of various consonances and of the anaphora many, create an impression of routine and tediousness, highlighting the strong imagery of journeys used in both stanzas. So we have in roads, so all of these are quite often repeated. The language and structure are fairly simple, which fits to the relative simplicity and language and innocence of the young maiden who sings the song. So the style is kind of adapted to the character, if you like. 
On the content level, however, the song reveals crucial aspects of the overall message of the narrative. While the first stanza is mainly concerned with parting, as indeed the characters of Anodos and the main do, the final line of the first stanza anticipates a reunion because all ways lead to a single end, namely death. So the theme of death features very prominently in Fantastus because Anodos undergoes several symbolic deaths during his journey, each of which transform him into an increasingly better person. Okay. <laughs> um, MacDonald, who himself was deeply religious, though in an unconventional sense, characterizes these spir spiritual deaths as thresholds to a higher level of existence that brings the individual closer to God. So this is actually the one home for all the world to win, suggested in um, the last line of the second stanza. If home is God and the journey, the metaphor for the progress of life, the images of road and inn can be interpreted accordingly as different stages of life. So as both the speaker, so the maiden, and the addressee, Anodos, of the poem are on their own respective journeys towards spiritual ennoblement, the poem simultaneously reflects the immediate situation of parting, but also conveys larger implications of the overall story. Sorry. Right, whereas this um, poem from Fantastus is actually interpolated within the prose narrative itself, there are also poems that are used as chapter epigraphs or prefaces for the entire work. One example thereof can be found in Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, which I'm sure you all know. Um, it has a prefatory poem before the actual narrative begins. It's pretty long. Huh? <laughs> all in the golden afternoon, full leisurely we glide, for both our oars, with little skill by little arms applied. With little, uh, while little hands make vain pretense, our wanderings to guide. Ah, cruel free, in such an hour, beneath such dreamy weather, to bag a tail of breath too weak, to stir the tiniest feather. Yet what can one poor voice avail against the tongues together? Imperious prima flashes forth her edict to begin it. In gentler tones, Secunda hopes there will be nonsense in it, while Tertia interrupts the tale not more than once a minute. Anon to sudden silence one, and fancy they pursue the dream child moving through a land of wonders wild and new, and friendly chat with bird or beast and half believe it true. And ever as the story drained, the wells of fancy dry, and faintly strove that weary one to put the subject by, the rest next time, it is next time, the happy voices cry. Thus grew the tale of Wonderland, thus slowly, one by one. Its quaint events were hammered out, and now the tale is done. And home we steer, a merry crew, beneath the setting sun. Alice, a childish story take, and with a gentle hand, lay it where childhood's dreams are twined in memory's mystic band. Like pilgrims with their wreath of flowers, Oh, I actually forgot a line. Um, far in the plucked of land, that's how it actually concludes. I'm going to interrupt for two seconds and say, I think we've been joined on the VC by Ross down in Perth. Ross, can you hear us? Hello, yeah, Ross. I figured it out. Hello. Okay, you Ross, can hear. Can I, can I be really rude and ask you to turn your microphone off unless you <laughs> actually want to speak? Because otherwise yeah. I keep going back and forth. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you. As it is pretty long, I won't, go, uh, won't be going into much detail, um, but there are a few aspects I'd like to focus on. Um, in terms of content, the poem describes a rowing excursion Lewis Carroll actually really undertook with the three little sisters. So Dean Little was actually his superior. And um, the sisters are called Lorena, Alice and Edith Little. And as you can see, the pun in the first stanza, little arms, little hands. So this is actually um, the indicator of the real event and the real people behind this. Um, so this um, 
this event, actually, Carol records in his diary, um, was the very day when he devised the story about Alice's adventures in Wonderland spontaneously for the entertainment of the children, which amused them so much that Alice requested that he should write it down. As we all know, this is what Carol did, and he gave the printed book to Alice as a present to which the final stanza alludes. So it's basically a dedication, if you will. The persistent iambic meter underlines the rhythmic regularity of the rowing, so it's perfectly timed. It's always this all in the golden afternoon, so the rowing, very rhythmical, and, um, and with golden afternoon light um, and the leisurely atmosphere, Carol turns the biographical event into poetic nostalgia. For in reality, the weather on the day was rather cloudy and cool, as the Me Meteorological Institute in London discovered. So it's actually a, a kind of poetic <laughs> embellishment. Notwithstanding its links to a real event, the poem also discloses key elements of the story to follow. I hope you can see that in the... I put it in highlighted color, so... Um, the strong emphasis on dreams is connected to the dream structure and the framing structure of the entire narrative because Alice's adventures all occur during a dream she has and from which she awakes at the end. Moreover, the setting of Wonderland is explicitly announced. So it says, thus grew the tale of Wonderland. And the children's interjections tell us that there will be nonsense in it and in the fourth stanza, even, uh, you, can, you can even find um, the protagonist, namely the dream child who's moving through a land of wonders wild and new and friendly chat with bird and beast, all of which is indeed a part of the story. So in so far, um, the prefatory poem basically bridges the border between reality and fiction and leads the reader into the story by anticipating information about the setting um, the protagonist and the general narrative structure. Let's turn to uh, my third example, Ooh, an Elvish poem by Tolkien. Um, I'm not fluent in Elvish, so um, all the Tolkien fans, please bear with me. <laughs> um, pardon if there's any possible corruption on the pronunciation. I'll do my very best. Okay, <laughs> here goes. A <laughs> Elbereth Gethoniel. Silivren penamiriel, Omene agla elenath, Nakaret palandiriel, O galath remin enorath, Fanuilos lelinathon, Nef aer si nef earon, A ebereth githoniel, Omene palandiriel, Lenalon si dungurothos, A tyronim fanuilos. So this translation into the common tongue <laughs> reads as follows. Um, o Elbereth star kindler, white glittering, slanting down, sparkling like a jewel, the glory of a starry host, having gazed far away from the tree-woven lands of Middle-earth, to thee, ever white, I will sing, on this side of the sea, here on this side of the ocean. O Elbereth star kindler, from heaven gazing afar, to thee I cry now beneath the shadow of death, O look towards me. Ever white. This poem um, is addressed to Elbereth, one of the highest Vala, who are powerful angelic creatures in Tolkien's story cosmos, and it is of course sung by the elves, Tolkien's famous fictional people. Well, although a linguist with a special interest in Tolkien's invented languages um, might give you a detailed account on the lexical and grammatical forms, the regular um, iambic tetrameter, at least gives you an inkling of the stress pattern of the world. So, you know, it's silivrin and it's silivrin, so this is actually a bit helpful here. What is much more important about this rendering in Elvish, however, is that we as readers get an idea of what the strange language of the elves could sound like. And also the illusion is created that there is actually a poetic Elvish tradition. Now, when we look at the content, we quickly notice that the song has the form of an ode, praising Elbereth, to whom the elves turn for comfort, as is exemplified by the apostrophe, A Elbereth or O Elbereth. By the singer's dedication to her <coughs> and the subsequent request that she would look towards the singer. 
If you care to plunge deeper into Tolkien's story cosmos, you will find out that the elves had been expelled from a paradisiacal country for their sins in the history before the events of the Lord of the Rings. So basically the poem is alluding to a mythical past that's actually preceding the story. In the sorrow of the exile in Middle-earth, they often call to Albereth and the starlight she is associated with so that the song actually amounts to a form of prayer. And in fact, there are parallels to the common prayer. So um, as an address of um, a, a deity in heaven or above in the sky somehow, and also the plea for deliverance from evil, sin, temptation, and so on. So quite some parallels here. Tokyo was deeply Catholic, so it should not be too surprising. Well, consequently, the use of this poem in the text and in a passage where the hobbits were quite ignorant at that point, uh, just beginning to learn more about the elves, conveys important information about the language, the fate, and the spirituality of the elves. It functions as a little window into elvish culture, enabling the hobbits to understand them better and simultaneously making this purely imaginary world and its creatures more believable for the reader too. For Tolkien, this credibility of the story world and its occurrences and characters, which Coleridge had termed the willing suspension of disbelief, and which is now sometimes called aesthetic illusion, the most, uh, this is actually the most fundament fundamental ingredient of a good story. So he says, inside the secondary world, that's his term for any invented or fictional world. Um, what the author relates is true. It accords with the laws of that world. You therefore believe it while you are, as it were, inside. The moment disbelief arises, the spell is broken. The magic, or rather art, has failed. You are then out in the primary world again, looking at the little abortive secondary world from outside. If you are obliged by kindliness or circumstance to stay, then disbelief must be suspended. And to this agenda, I think poems like the one just discussed form an invaluable contribution. Well, so far we've covered a time range from the 1850s to the 1950s, but in order to show you that interpolated poems can also be found in contemporary fantasy novels, I've chosen my last example from J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter series. In the first book, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, Harry gets introduced to the wizard world full of magical creatures. One of them is the Sorting Hat, a talking and actually thinking old hat uh, that is capable of looking into each student's minds and according to what it finds there, allocates them to the respective house where they seem to fit in best. As it is a unique fantastic character that needs explanation not only for Harry, but for the reader too, the hat promptly introduces itself in form of a poem. Oh, you may not think I'm pretty, but don't judge on what you see. I'll eat myself if you can find a smarter hat than me. You can keep your ballers black, your top hat sleek and tall, for I'm the Hogwarts sorting hat and I can cut them all. There's nothing hidden in your head the sorting hat can't see. So try me on and I will tell you where you ought to be. You might belong in Gryffindor, but dwell the brave at heart. The daring nerve and chivalry set Gryffindors apart. You might belong in Hufflepuff, where they are just and loyal. Those patient Hufflepuffs are true and unafraid of toil. Or yet in wise old Ravenclaw, if you've already mind, where those of wit and learning will always find their kind. Or perhaps in Slytherin, you'll make a real friends. Those cunning folk use any means to achieve their ends. So put me on, don't be afraid, and don't get in a flap. You're in safe hands, though I have none, for I'm a thinking cat. Due to its alternating iambic tetra and trimeter with many trochaic inversions and its run-on lines, the poem attains an almost conversational rhythm. The hat basically gives us a form of self-characterization. It clarifies... Uh, okay. Can I... Thanks. No. Just, just, just close it. 
Yeah, just... Ah, there we go again. Okay. <laughs> so it clarifies its belonging to the species of hats, admits its poor appearance, but it also foregrounds its extraordinary intelligence and its special faculty of reading the minds of those it sits on top. What is particularly interesting is the sorting hat's shift in style. While it returns a fairly objective but elevated style when introducing the assets of the four houses, for example, um, uh, as you can see in the many archaic words, um, when it talks about the ancient house of Hogwarts like dwell, chivalry, and toil, these uh, pretty much contrast with the quite self-assured and humorous um, expressions when the hat is actually talking about itself. So the puns on, I can cap them all, I eat myself, and you're in safe hands, though I have none, these all obviously um, foreground the, uh, yeah, the character's hatness, so to speak. In book four of the Harry Potter series, there's yet another poem spoken by the Sorting Hat in which it relates its genesis. So taken together, these two poems actually form um, a concise self-portrait of the Sorting Hat. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to look into that poem, but um, if you really like Harry Potter and its fantastic work, I can just strongly recommend that you have a look at it. All right, on that note, I would like to conclude this short excursion into my PhD topic. I hope I could give you um, an idea of the heterogeneous influences that helped shape the genre of literary fantasy and possibly contributed to its affinity for interpolated poems. More importantly, I uh, hope that these uh, delineations may play a humble part in raising your awareness for such interpolations so that the next time you flick through a book, and are started by a sudden shift from prose to poetry, you give it a chance and see um, what uh, it can tell you about the general narrative and what it merits. Thank you so much for your attention. And yeah, I hope you could understand me out there. <laughs> and these are my sources if you're interested in that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, we've got lots of time for questions. Ross, I'm zooming out so you can see this. There's more of us in the rest. You can see us. Um, we can't see you. I think your camera's off. Um, but if you do have any questions, you want to say anything, please, please join in. This is good. <laughs> any questions, thoughts, comments from the floor? I have one that's maybe quite general. I wonder if, it, if the and the answers you've, you've talked about, if you find them sort of using fantasy and imagining well to kind of allegorically to deal with kind of contemporary concepts in the way you say they do very often in the science fiction. Yes, certainly. I, I would certainly say so. Um, George MacDonald would be a very good example because he um, had very theological agenda, so to speak, and often, for example, Fantastus is often compared to the Pilgrim's Progress, which is, of course, a huge allegory on uh, how you proceed in life and how this journey leads you to a kind of Jerusalem. So, um, so there's certainly um, the author's personal agendas they try to kind of communicate with their works. And um, for Lewis Carroll, for example, would be a very good um, example. He was very subversive in his writing, so he ridiculed um, 19th century um, children's education a lot with his poems. So actually, um, there's an interesting example um, it's a poem called The Little Busy Bee, or, or How Does the Little Busy Bee Improve Its Shining Eyes? It's a very didactic uh, poem, and Carol uses it in his world to turn it around into a very predatory and gruesome vision of a sort of a Darwinian world, so survival of the fittest, basically. So it's actually often um, get these politics of um, um, contemporary issues, um, turned around or tackled or discussed in some way or other in the fantastic world. Yeah, definitely, I'd say so. I think that goes for all of them. Tolkien, for example, um, takes up the issue of war a lot. And, of course, he's been, uh, he's been involved in World War I and kind of used um, fantasy writing as a kind of therapy as well. So this actually features as well. Well, I was... Uh, I, uh, I looked it up 
but I, I, I'm one of the person I've entered Lord of the Rings about nine, and I've read the appendices and thought, wow, he's even better. And I was kind of reading all the kind of weird things about how you how you're spelling dwarfish and things like that. But <laughs> the, the lovely idea about the fact that the the um, the songs and Cinder and the songs and Elvish that give us a kind of insight into this world of tradition. But I love the fact that that's actually there. And those are just the selections that yeah. we put in, and there's this massive corpus yeah. of Elvish and Dwarf, yeah. particularly Elvish poetry that yeah. he's written yeah. and doesn't go into these books. Yeah. And Christopher Tolkien leaves out of the Silmarillion, but it's yeah. it's, it's this it's it's just he's dipping into that. So when you say it gives you this hint of the tradition, it's kind of it is actually there, which I think adds this extra dimension yeah. to yeah. it and makes the world. Even mm-hmm. Yeah, I would definitely agree. I think that the point of this use of fragments, so to speak, yeah, so it appears in uh, in the novel itself, it seems, oh, you get bits and pieces and only glimpses of this um, bigger context that's kind of looming in the background kind of makes it very credible. I would definitely say so. And yeah, um, I can only recommend reading The Silmarillion if you're into uh, fantasy because it makes this entire cosmos really amazing so with all this historical background etc right <laughs> no poetry uh, or oh, little poetry in there. <laughs> how is it oh great we should introduce that in fact alice in wonderland and the silmarillion on our second year course it's not the fantasy course it's the epic course so you think the work is epics as well don't disagree. <laughs> <laughs> no, I definitely won't disagree. Um, I kind of have trouble with the term epic, though, because it seems very broad and seems to encompass a lot. So, um, so I won't disagree, but um, I would question where to draw the line. So maybe so this. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and of course, within within fantasy literature, you also get all sorts of different subgenres. Yeah, so you get urban fantasy and whatever, so uh, lots of it. I'm very happy to hear that in Scotland uh, we invented the fantasy yeah. genre. <laughs> 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 else in the modern world. Yeah, <laughs> I'm actually thinking about going to Huntley because George MacDonald was born there, mm-hmm. and. Um, that's just round the corner, isn't it? It's also not too far away. <laughs> well, for me, from Germany, it's around the corner. So I try to. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. I think Walter Scott definitely played a big part in that because um, if you look at his romances, um, there's a close connection between romances and many fantasy works, obviously, so the medieval uh, themes, etc., cetera, um, pop up. And um, his use of poetry, so the idea of kind of giving glimpses of a larger poetic tradition is something I think many fantasy writers picked up, actually. So. I, mean, I suppose he also kind of legitimised the novel, rather than being something, you know, predominantly for women, something that's quite serious, as some serious authors could do. And then you have to kind of knock on, and that, you know, doing imaginary worlds and so on, is also kind of legitimate. And, and, and uh, yeah, definitely. And I also think that he presents a nice uh, country example. So if you have um, Dickens novels, and etc., so you don't find any or little poetry in there, or Elizabeth Gaskell, for example. Whereas in 18th century novels, you do find quite a bit of poetry. So when we talk about Roderick Random next week, it actually contains a few poems. I was quite surprised to find that. But that changes in the course of the 19th century. So um, the realist novelists stick more to prose. And um, so Scott, with his romance, has actually produced a kind of mixed style, which is um, something fantasy writers picked up, in my opinion. Any, any other questions, comments? For a very short time, I thought we'd gone back to Dada. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think 
half London, half the town of Dublin's talked to Peter Jackson. It's a bit over where we want to advise the Hobbit haven't in terms of films. But you know, Lord of the Rings, again, does, you know, even then when they're bringing in kind of the cinematic world, they bring in the kind of, oh, we have to get the extra bits of music and things like that. Mm -hmm. And bringing in things like that. And it, as I say, the, the world building of that is really interesting. And I think also the way in which so much of it is generated from poetry. Mm -hmm. mm. This is very much prose mm -hmm. from poetry, even the kind of the uh, the old ballads that are fitting yeah. into the yeah. old things like that. So again, it's kind of yeah. I think yeah, fantasy and poetry are great. Yeah, really well. and. Um, Actually, now you, now you mention it, um, one of the arguments in my thesis is also that um, poetry uh, assumes a very strong world-building function, not only in that it creates a kind of larger cosmos that's kind of looming in the background, but um, sometimes you even have very vivid descriptions of places. So you actually, um, when you think of Gimli, for example, there's a passage when he stands outside Casa Doom and sees a lake then he bursts into poetry um, about this lake and describes the lake and its history. So, so um, all the many names and places in Middle Earth actually get personal character. So and this is actually done through poetry. That's quite amazing. I love when yeah. Tennyson's It Also the King, where they kind of, it's all the, all the descriptions of all the kind of wonderful, beautiful, perfect things. Like, oh, there's a battle. Uh, right, let's move on to kind of describe the more beautiful <laughs> the whole kind of modern area of romance. Yeah. Is kind of, Tennyson doesn't really do battles very well. Mm. He discovered the Twelve Black Days. Uh, so the, it's the way in which that kind of. I remember reading the whole Liddles uh, a few years ago and mm -hmm. just laughing because every time we got to the battle, he just gave it back to the <laughs> and then moved on to more interesting stuff. That's, it's interesting, it's, yeah. Yeah. So again, there's the. the Fantasy tradition still continues, but not quite. Mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. it yeah. Um, another another good example of a contemporary novel would also be um, A Song of Ice and Fire. So those of you who watch Game of Thrones, The Reigns of Castamere, it's actually a poem in the novel. So it tells you something about the history preceding the actual events. That's great. So you get an idea of a bigger world. And right. it's used as a plot device. Plot device. Yeah, yeah, mm. definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can we regard poetry as a, an, an older form of literature? <laughs> going back to primary ethics and things. So I was in, like, Tolkien, and he's in this sort of um, elvish literature that it would obviously be in um, the form of poetry, because in our mm -hmm. sort of Western tradition, kind of poetry being older than prose. Mm. So I think you're kind of looking back, so that poetry has this sort of, um, this, is, this kind of historic association, but also just sort of being earlier and being mm -hmm. more... Well, I'm not sure about whether it's really older, um, but I would definitely agree that it has the touch of kind of mythical, epic poetry to it. So, so all these associations of being old, legendary, etc., all feed into the notion poetry has. And I think this is also exploited in many fantasy Narratives. I mean, because of the older ones you're talking about, it's still novels relatively recent for. Yeah, yeah. And so that's the novel true. being the, mm -hmm. becoming the kind of predominant literary form of yeah. older from poetry. And all, and all the. Uh, mm. So poetry at this point still carries a lot of baggage. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And all the uh, major uh, heroic epics um, like Beowulf, for example, or the Nibelung Lied in German. Um, it's all written in verse, of course. So, so it definitely has this kind of touch of antiquity and legend and so on to it. Yeah. This is my chance to say Ossian. Ossian does yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say Yedas, but you know. You find lots of examples. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but again, it's the, 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 the kind of the, the older one, and the sagas, the, the sagas come in later. Mm -hmm. It's, under, it's retelling story from the older yeah. letters and the older kind of yeah. the old the older poems and things like that. So yeah, it's in terms of I think the fictional world building. Mm -hmm. Yes, 
has much, much yeah. more established and older yeah. in that sense. But it's also that's the best mm -hmm. prime resources mm -hmm. use it. Mm -hmm. It's what they it's what they've got. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. what these things emerge from. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It, it has that character and it sometimes it has that character in even the prose fiction. It carries over this mm -hmm. element of its poetic origin in the not even when not even the interlope the thing is, uh, mm -hmm. but it's, it's actually in the prose fiction itself, the prose style can carry traces of poetic mm -hmm. if, you, if you want to find it there. Mm -hmm. find it. <laughs> if you don't believe it's there, it won't be there, but you want to find it there. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's kind of, yeah. it's, it's the bardic tradition, isn't it? Mm. The, the, the whole, whole lots of them, there's all, yeah. all these ones all through mm -hmm. the coming, coming in from these various. I say, which is still going on in these parts mm -hmm. of the tradition. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to ask a practical question yeah. um, for the students in mind. Um, some of whom are looking at dissertations and been trying to narrow down topics for, for a while now. Some of whom are looking forward to dissertations and thinking, how on earth am I going to find them? How did you come up with your research topic and how did you narrow it down? Um, well, yeah, the narrowing down part was <laughs> very <laughs> tricky. Um, how did I come up with it? Well, um, I've loved Tolkien for a long time, and of course I noticed um, that there were many, many poems in there. And contrary to many people I've spoken to who actually s often say, oh, do you actually read those poems? I usually skip them because I find them boring. And now I think, oh, how can you? <laughs> and this actually led me to the question, okay, why, there must be a reason why... <clears throat> these poems are in there. They must have a function. And the narrative would certainly change if you left them out. And this is actually um, how I came to this topic. So I've been asking myself, okay, and um, so what do these poems do in the narratives? And I discovered that the many, many fantasy works actually have lots of poetry in it. And then um, I tried to find the links between if there's a general if there are general mechanisms behind it, something like that. And this is how I came by the topic. And narrowing down was very difficult because the, the, the tradition is still going on with Potter and so on. Um, so I basically chose a time frame. So from the beginning, supposed beginning with George MacDonald's proper first fantasy novel um, up to... Tolkien, who in my opinion kind of created the, in my opinion, most complete and most complex secondary world. Because from then on, you have variations, and um, I kind of have this time frame of 100 years now. Um, I have five novels who actually are about 20 or 25 years apart, so I can actually trace the development of um, usage of um, po poems in there. So if there's a change or if there are certain ideas that are still going on. So this is how I kind of, but it took a lot of time and a lot of reading to find out, okay, what works actually have enough of poetry in it because I couldn't choose works that only have two lines or maybe one poem because it's just not kind of um, representative. So um, I kind of try to find a middle way between, okay, there's enough poetry in there to be noticeable and um, it has to fit into that time frame somehow. And all of them, that was another criterion I chose, all of them have to create a fictional story world, not only in the sense that all fiction creates a story world, but um, a very kind of detached story world that is significantly detached from our real world. So we have Fairyland and Fantastis, Wonderland and uh, Carol. Um, we have, with William Morris, who I'm working on as well, um, we have this kind of not further defined kind of primeval um, Germanic past, but it seems very, very detached as well. Um, I also work on Addison's The Worm Ouroboros, which is not very well known, but um, it's actually a bit yeah, science fiction because his story actually takes place on the planet Mercury. 
but it's all very heroic fantasy. It's very, very interesting. So he's in, and of course, Tolkien, because his fantasy world's um, mm. important. And since this is one of my main arguments that poetry helps creating these story worlds that I needed a kind of detached story world. So this is another criterion. That so trust your research instinct is the key thing. Yeah, Notice yeah. And, and do something you like. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the, the biggest, the biggest um, advice I can give, yeah, because it has to sustain you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then there is poetry in science fiction as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there's poetry in science fiction written. Ian and Banks has, in some of his culture novels, has poems written by non biologicals. Mm. Lines. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. Poetry, yeah. <laughs> which then can get printed in books as kind of, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You've gone somewhere else in altogether. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, it's also just, do we have enough time? Mm -hmm. um, there's another thing, um, I didn't have time to mention it in um, my talk, but with George MacDonald, for example, since you mentioned the Scottish <laughs> writers, what is also interesting, he not only uses poetry he wrote himself, so like the one I mentioned, but he used lots of already existing poetry. So he uses Wordsworth, he uses German romanticists a lot, which is also an advantage for me, <laughs> of course. Um, and so he basically, in Fantastis at least, he comes up a range from Chaucer up to contemporary 19th century poets. And it's quite interesting. So how these poems that already exist and were written by others interact with the poems he wrote himself. So it's very... Fascinating to look at. Any more questions, comments? No? Right. In that case, I think we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, thank you very much. That was, that was fascinating. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it fits in very well with um, the kind of things we teach. Great. Thank you. Thank you.